Hey there, YouTube. It's where I speak with you before the live show. We have our cold open coming up, Silence of the Mug Club. Just wanted to let you know that YouTube has announced they will now be curating your subscription feed. So it's not going to be chronological. This is a major change. Obviously, it means a lot for Lotto with Crowder. So listen, if you want the show to keep going, it's more important than ever that you join at lottowithcrowder.com slash mug club to see the daily show. Or if not, if you can't afford that and watch the daily show, just bookmark the page and check it every day. We do videos every day. It's the one way YouTube can't uh, keep us from communicating with you. Enjoy the show. Lotto with Crowder Studios. Protected exclusively by Walther. Good morning, Mr. Shapiro. My name is Nake Jared. May I speak with you? You're one of Crowders, aren't you? I'm still working in a studio, yes. Still? Still not gay? Well, well, you, see, well you see, I... I, I Okay, then now, tell me, Kimmel, what did he say to you? Kip, Kip Kimmel in the, in the next cell? He hissed at you. What did he say? He said, I can smell your mug. I see. I myself cannot. You drink Folgers, sometimes Maxwell House, but not today. Did you do all those drawings, Mr. Shapiro? Neither am I. A lot of tumblers. I've seen holding left his tears. All that detail just from memory, sir? The simple fact is, memory is what I have, not gay here, instead of view. Perhaps you'd like to lend us your view on this Muck Club registration form, no, sir? No, 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 no. The, the fact is, you were doing fine. You had been courteous, receptive to courtesy, not gay. And now, with this ham handed segue to the Muck Club registration form, the fact is, it simply won't do. It's much better than your tumbler. You're so ambitious, aren't you? You know what you look like to me with your jogger pants and your hipster glasses? You look like a f You look like a well-trained, late-night producing f with a little following. You're a smart guy, Shapiro. But are you smart enough to point that high-powered perception at your asbestos-laden tumbler? What about it? Why don't you really look at it and write down what you see? Maybe you're afraid to. Pierce Morgan. Once tried to test me, I had his liver with some vodkas and a nice manischewitz. Like the wine? Yes. Why? That's unnecessarily Jewish. That's just your lazy writing. called the Kevin Spacey at the Boy Scouts Ball. <laughs> or Fleet Week, really, as long as they're young enough. Uh, listen, we have a huge show we have to get into. We have Ralph Macchio on the show. Yes. Boom. Then we Boom. have Martin Cove, Crease, Sensei Crease on the show. Oh. Cobra Kai, and then also the Hodge Twins. And the Hodge oh. Twins. Hope you have your sensor button ready. <laughs> it is... So you Ralph have a lot of work to now. do in post, yeah. and we're going to be talking about the NFL, uh, their latest well, their latest policy regarding kneeling. How President Trump weighed in on it. We'll be talking about North Korea. Also, we're we'll talking about the myth that the United States was built off of the backs of slaves. Mm -hmm. uh, hint, spoiler alert. Eh, it's not exactly true. So we have a lot of news to get to today. And uh, my question, I guess, well, f first off, 
I guess let me ask the question before I introduce him. The question's more important than who's producing. Uh, do you like seeing President Trump tossing in his lot here with the NFL? Do you think it's time that a president chime in on cultural issues, or do you think it ta some people think that it takes away from issues like North Korea, which could involve our impending doom if they, <laughs> if they had capabilities? Oh. Um, what do you think? Do you, do you like it when they, when they put their oar in a president? Do you think he should be more presidential, or do you think, hey, all right, it's time? I, I'm curious. I've seen opinions on both sides from both Trump supporters and people who cannot stand Trump. Producing will be in video studio, as always, is Jared, who is not getting Follow him on Twitter at NotGay. Jared, me describe with your comments. I thought your photoshops. I fulfill my legal obligations. Draw your own conclusions. Are we good? I can smell you. Oh, careful now. Ooh. That might be misinterpreted. At G. Morgan Jr., how are you, sir? I'm doing well. I watched Karate Kid last night. Did you? Just to get ready for this. Wow, so you finally prepared. I, well, yeah, on accident. I had no idea. No, I'm kidding. How much <laughs> wine were you consuming during Karate Kid? No. Most of this bottle. Duck What's Horn, Three Palms, Merlot. Duck, duck Horn, Three Palms, Duck-horn, Merlot. Who comes up with these palms. names? Why is that three, so long? There's three palm trees. John Jacob, Jingleheimer, Schmidt, and he <laughs> soused too. too. Sven Computer, are you ready? I'm ready with the with overlays. overlays. Beep, beep. Yeah. Uh, I blocked Gerald on Twitter because he's an alcoholic. Uh, I blocked naturally. Samka Edward, beep, beep, because I'm still sal salty that he carp stomped me. Yeah, that's uh, true. I blocked Jared yeah. because he likes milk and he shouldn't drink it. And I blocked you because you don't love me. <laughs> I didn't even know you could Ooh. block anyone. I thought he was off Twitter. Really? You're not allowed to block now, by You're not allowed to block. Not That's going to be a gift. What? Uh, so news of the day, Donald Trump. First, we have to get to this. It's pulled out of the North Korea summit. Mm. Mm. So uh, CNN has this. This is what he said in his letter to Kim Jong-un. Let this, let this letter serve to represent that the Singapore summit will not take place. Okay, frankly, you talk about nuclear capabilities, but ours are so massive. This is a quote. <laughs> ours are so massive, so powerful, that I pray to God I will ne <laughs> they will never have to be used. Fingers crossed, you... You filthy son of a bitch. <laughs> you oriental son of a bitch. And I said, I don't care. Oriental son of a bitch. North Koreans count, yeah. <laughs> Go for it. So this has been a rough, <laughs> fast-paced few weeks on the deal. And uh, courtesy of Obama, we actually have leaked, tapped audio from their latest phone call. Hey, Kim Jong. Yeah, hey, Donald. You see, I just found my nuclear facility for you. Yeah, but I hear you've been, you've been talking a lot of trash, okay? Oh, no, Donald. You, you listen to the wrong people. No, no, no. See, frankly, it seems like we're going back and forth all the time. And it seems like such a oh, waste of time. Donald, Donald, okay. come on. And if that's what it's all about. Donald, Donald. And I pull it out. Donald, Donald, you got it out. I pull it out. Donald. Who wants to deal with the zipper head? Oh, Donald. How about I just nuke your whole country? <laughs> he is not one for diplomacy. He has pulled out of more deals than Morgan Freeman has nieces. Come on now. Ooh. That is terrible. Ooh. It's his own fault. And far too and, accurate. And I for also don't have a bit of faith that Kim Jong really got rid of his nuke. His nuke. Oh, It'd be like Trump right. walking in the little kid's room saying, did you clean it up? But like, what? Yeah, clean it up. Yeah. What, what's, what's on your blanket right there, Kim Jong? Give me. Oh, give me. Nothing. nothing. And nothing. in reality, it's, it's, yeah. it, it, is that a dead dog? Yeah, and yeah. nukes. And nukes. Um, <laughs> Don't look. Did you see Nancy Pelosi saying this was a big win for this was a this was a big win for Kim Jong Un because he was legitimized? Like you, 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 your people, you were the architects yes. of the Iran deal. Yes. <laughs> really? How do you get to say this? Because it was going to oh. meet with them. The words come out your mouth. Listen to them. Now kill yourself. <laughs> Listen to them. <laughs> Maybe kill yourself. On to more urgent stories. Uh, Stormy Daniels was now awarded the key to the city That's about time. of Wait For It. West Hollywood. Yeah, from uh. USA Today. <laughs> Officials of the city said in a release that they chose to recognize Daniels because in these politically tumultuous times, she has proven herself, quote, to be a profile in courage by speaking truth to power, even under threats for safety and under, under extreme intimidation. Um, so they were really big fans, uh, though half the audience actually left when they realized Stormy was, in fact, a woman. So they just <laughs> thought, oh, yeah. <laughs> we thought she just did it. You thought she had a really good stylist. <laughs> Unfortunately, the event was actually cut short when she choked on the city key. So oh, that was something. That, old habits oh, die hard. So what oh. if Stormy Daniels? Oh, yeah, that's true. she did. That's true. She was not as skilled in the art of key love. Oh my How many people have keys to West Hollywood these days, by the way? Um, like everyone has a key. Didn't even know Pretty much the doing. entire cast of Rent, I just think. Like, just like Stormy's <laughs> chastity belt. Everyone, oh. <laughs> everyone has a key. Everyone has a key. Why are we glorifying the I don't the think there is star. a chastity belt. <laughs> <laughs> How brave is she? Well, she's very brave. I don't, I don't know. She's brave. Incredibly. I don't think she's brave. You have to be somewhat brave to sleep with that guy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. She's definitely brave. <laughs> I don't know. So now the Obamas, speaking of brave, brave and beautiful, they've now signed a deal with Netflix and uh, formed the company Higher Ground Productions. In case you were un <laughs> under the ill-informed illusion that they were self-important. <laughs>
it's it's because from NPR. Netflix said in the statement that the Obamas would produce, quote, a diverse mix of content, including docu-series, documentaries, and features. So their main show is uh, launching on Netflix, also titled, ironically, Orange is the New Black. They didn't really need to change a whole... <laughs> they already had the template. <laughs> And apparently, right, they might, they might actually, the Obamas might wade into doing fiction, right, Sven Computer? Yeah, this is from uh, Inverse.com. They said, fiction is probably an option, you know. Fiction, like uh, your legacy. Mr. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> Ironically, it sounds more, much more harsh coming from a German. Ironically, they're probably more uh, uh, qualified for television than the White House. Yeah. I mean, this is this the is same true. guy who said no to Netanyahu to meet with Glazal Green, right? Yes. Same guy? But we already, gave him, we already gave him one. I forgot that. I forgot that. So it's like... <laughs> <laughs> That's one of our favorite memes we ever did was the Glozell Gl Green. People yeah. don't remember it. Was... Yahoo Dad. <laughs> <our meme. laughs> Mr. President, there are lo rockets being launched from the Gaza Strip. We would like to. But I ain't Cheerios from my bathtub, though. <laughs> I want a summit. <laughs> and I'm going to drink Coke. Go. I'm on the YouTubes. <laughs> yeah. I thought you had something to say. Oh, I did, but you went past it. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I went right. past I'll cry it. about it later. A 30-year-old man has now appealed the court's decision, uh, which ruled in favor of his parents who kicked him out of the house. Uh, I love it. Here's what, every now and then you get this perfect moment, that moment on national television when you realize that you've done, you've, you've thought none of this through. Let's rewind for a second, because it's my understanding you've lived, you know, at your parents' house, rent-free for of eight course. years. And I know you do your own laundry, you buy your own oh, food, good. but they asked you five times, please <laughs> move out. Why couldn't you guys resolve this without the court? I would consider uh, much of uh, what they were doing to try to get me out as a tax and what I was trying to, I was just, uh, you know, res mm. <laughs> <laughs> think fast, think fast, think fast. David Hogg, freeze frame. <laughs> Am I still in the split view? <laughs> Are they gonna play me off? <laughs> How do I get off? He looks like Weird Al Yankovic <laughs> ate a fatter, weirder, more lonely Weird Al Yankovic. I was hoping that he wouldn't look exactly how he looks. If yeah, someone said, read the headline. sketch me a 30-year-old who lives with his parents, that's exactly what you would draw. It's that guy. Yes, yes. It's that guy. Yeah. He's going to be in movies from here to... To be yeah. fair, he actually has a very awesome girlfriend from Canada. She's a model. Yeah. You don't know her. Oh. Actually, she's a level 7 wind runner from World of Warcraft. <laughs> Okay, six. He. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to. I was just. Uh, you know. Was, mm. <laughs> don't make the sound. Mm. Don't don't narrate when your brain breaks. <laughs> it's, 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 literally, you don't hear like. That's brain break. What all one in his head? And he went. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you sound like Milton with the staple. Just don't say anything. It's just like, stop. <laughs> it's like me oh. stepping on jokes and saying it out loud. Oh. Yeah. How awkward was it, you think, when he had to go to his dad, ask him to borrow a suit to wear to court? To yeah. <laughs> that moment. So you're me. suing me. Uh, I'd like to why, look why would I give you a suit to sue me? Dad, you're such a son of a bitch. <laughs> I can't believe you guys. <laughs> Gosh. Uh, uh. Also, by the way, um, he, he devils up. He, he, he actually does make a living as a, as oh. a roadie for Guar. So there's that. <laughs> I don't know why. That's what I thought. Clothes on ad hominem. Him. That's, that's, that's how we. That's how we roll. Yeah. All right, Gainesville, Florida. A man has been accused of. Oh God. Okay. You're gonna get mad at us until you see the punchline. So it's okay, right? He gets his. Gainesville, Florida man has been accused of punching a pregnant deaf woman. That sounds bad on its surface. Yes, we know. And her service dog <laughs> aboard a Frontier Airlines flight. Yeah. Manly complained of being allergic to dogs as the plane descended and was being taxied to the gate at the Orlando International Airport. Timothy Manley then punched the service dog, causing it to yelp. Police said he then punched the owner, who is deaf and about 20 weeks pregnant. <laughs> That's like the trifecta. Sorry, we're overbooked, said Satan. <laughs> he didn't even have the right form for you to fill out. But, Your Honor, it was Frontier. Exactly. Can you imagine him? Jesus. Uh oh, oh, oh ooh, ooh. close, yeah, yeah. close oh. one. Almost caught the devil. The, st the story clarifies by the fact that he was actually he was upset. It turns out he was upset with the husband, the owner, actually, yeah. of the dog. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but then when he was confronted, he instead opted to punch his deaf pregnant wife. Mm. 
So this is a special kind of piece. Similarly, when he was approached by what he saw as hostile air marshals, he teabagged a nun. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's reasonable. And then threw a small child out the window. <laughs> Can you imagine this guy starting any sentence with, okay, okay, but in my defense... <laughs> I was on Frontier Airlines. It's hell. In my defense, you know what? I'll allow you to continue. <laughs> it, it, Let's it, see it, where this it goes. It yeah. was Frontier. I, what do you expect? Saying? Who, well, certainly, who amongst us on a spirit flight has not felt like they wanted to punch a deaf 20-week pregnant woman? Yeah. I think you're alone on that one. Yeah. Usually the stewardess. <laughs> Don't you love how the left, by the way, is just outraged by this when it's it's a 20-week pregnant woman who wants to have the baby? Yeah, exactly. She doesn't want to have it. It's like, that's now a human right. No, it's not. It's a clump of cells. Who knew? Flush it down the airplane toilet. Horrible human beings. They're evil. Okay, so Germany, speaking of evil, Germany, your homeland. See that? Yeah. That's Fencom. Shut oh. up. Uh, Germany is now training Syrian. I don't even know. I, I, people think this is fake. Syrian the? asylum seekers to become truck drivers. <laughs> the transport industry slag Holstein. What? Lacks 1,200 motorists, so with a nationwide unique project, the Logistics Association, the UVL, and the DRK Care Services in Kiel now want to hire refugees as truck drivers. Really? Said all the Syrian migrants trading in their machetes for CDLs. <laughs> it's true. Germans really do make everything more efficient. <laughs> Why stop there? Just throw in some 747s and box cutters. See what, what happens. Do, what do they think? Like, they just, they, they, Germany should just host a shark tank for terrorists. <laughs> Okay, look, this looks like a normal knife, right? Okay, I am seeking 20 million for 40% stake to kill the Jews. <laughs> the, the WIC program already covers beard trimmers and acid, so just, you know, why not? I just, I, I, what, you know there's going to be a story about this. Yeah, such a lack of awareness of, like, what's going on in the rest of the world. <laughs> <laughs> Can you believe A lack of awareness of what's going on in their own country. In their own country, too, yes, of course. How else are we supposed to drive away from climate change? <laughs> <laughs> They would have a they would have a job if you, if you, they if they wouldn't be terrorists if you drove a Tesla. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Teslas are human rights. Teslas are oh, human Germany. rights. Okay. Hashtag. All right. So speaking of human rights, speaking of birth rights, uh, obviously freedom of assembly, freedom to protest is one here in the United States. So the NFL kneeling situation, it was a big situation a long time ago with Colin Kaepernick, yeah. and now it's come full circle. Everyone's talking about this. That's why, again, the question of the day, do you like when the president weighs in on this? And I wanted to tie this into the myth to uh, that the United States was built or dependent yeah. on slavery. That's one thing that I, I don't – just take a basic economic course and it won't hold up. Slavery was bad. I'm not defending it. Anyway, let's start with the NFL. So the NFL has now announced their policy. It will require players on the field to stand for the national anthem or, or teams could be fined. This is them announcing it. If anyone is on the field and is disrespectful to the anthem or the flag, uh, there would be a fine from the league against the team, and they will make their own decisions about how to manage that from there. Okay, that seems pretty cut and dry. Of Easy. course, this has the left uh, everywhere, but we just really wanted to pull one clip. You'll see why. <laughs> Throwing a race-baiting tantrum. Roll Buffalo. First of all, the commissioner says they will impose appropriate discipline it on really the players like if they right? dare to express their freedom of speech. Um, lashings, maybe? Uh, I don't know what the discipline oh. will be. <laughs> lashings. <laughs> Slavery reference. Of course. Uh, uh, lunchtime. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> So um, now here's the thing. Despite the trending narrative right now, a lot of people saying that the NFL, the NFL kneels for Trump is what was trending exactly on right. the New York yeah, Times. Yeah, yeah. yeah, in the New York Times, or the NFL kneels for Trump's. <laughs> we'll come back to. That's not what this is about. I want to make sure that there is no order from the president that you understand. The NFL first created a policy in response to kneeling during the anthem. By the way, which is common across a lot of other leagues, like the NBA. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. This is not Absolutely. you. Absolutely. There, it, nary a black man to be found <laughs> in the NBA. <laughs> It's black, 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 black. Nowitzki yeah, for absolutely. a couple more it's years. Black, 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 yeah. black. Hall of Fame Stockton. That's about <laughs> it. <laughs> but they did. They made it a policy, likely because of record low numbers and revenue, which they were seeing as a result of all the kneeling. Some people want to just escape and watch football as opposed to dealing with politics. That's why they're turning to sports as opposed to Fox News. Mm -hmm. So President Trump, uh, again, spoke. Th this is what's causing all the controversy. He spoke out on the NFL's policy. This is the first time you're hearing this. What's your reaction, Mr. President? Well, I think that's good. I don't think people should be staying in locker rooms, but still, I think it's good. You have to stand proudly for the national anthem. Well, you shouldn't be playing. You shouldn't be there. Maybe you shouldn't be in the country. <laughs> I, first well... of all, no, I don't. I don't disagree. I understand the sentiment. Yeah, yeah. I, I do think there's a little bit of those things like Trump. Just, just let Roger Goodell be the bad guy for five <laughs> no, hot minutes. Like, wait a second. Wait a second. Wait a second. Twelve hours where someone, Roger Goodell's the asshole. No, I'm the only asshole. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about it? Get rid of the blacks. <laughs> <laughs> if I was just press person, I'd take away the phone. I think it would be great. 
frankly, these blacks are so good at sports. If we could have one to call our own, don't you think that'd be great? <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> That's the kind of thing. <laughs> anyway, the point is, I guess we have golf, except for what, what, is, what is the buy rate, the tiger? I don't know. Yeah. But we both had to go with Stormy Daniels. Um, <laughs> So many of the players, of course, are now threatening to, if you've been seeing this, threatening to move to Canada if the new rule is implemented. Yeah. Uh, and Colin Kaepernick is now the MVP of all of Canada. So that's good. It seems like <laughs> there's a silver lining. Nice. So, Why are you laying on your fine. feet, Colin? I mean, I think, it, yeah. Well, I, look, the NFL is a business. These guys have the opportunity to, to do whatever they want any day of the Except week. Except they're a nonprofit, which muddies the water. Well, I, yeah. mean, I mean the owners, their own teams, right? Yeah. You sign on, there's code of conduct, there's everything else. Fine. Use your platform outside of that. You got six other days of every single week to be a jerk and uninformed. Go right. for it. Right. Use it to your your advantage. It's fine. Yeah. Why is this a problem? Well, I I think um, a couple things here. Like we said, it, it is a nonprofit. I know people talk about that. But you're talking about business. How in the world did they get? That? I have no like, idea. Who? I want to know the backstory of how a multi billion dollar business is a nonprofit. I don't know how the IRS <laughs> looks like. Walks in the merch store. Okay. And what is this? Well, that's a jersey that sells for about one twenty five. That's a mug that sells for forty nine ninety five. That's an autographed mug that sells for about two hundred and fifty five thousand dollars. <laughs> and uh, we'd like our five hundred one c three status. Yes. <laughs> we'd like to not pay taxes on any of it. Thank you. It's like the it's the insanity plea of business. Yeah. Well, you know, I was crazy when I murdered those five people, but. I'm not anymore. I'm good now I think I should be free. Get it out of my system. <laughs> well, button dry for me. Um, so I, I do think they should have let this whole story die a little bit though, because it was oh, kind of old news. It was over. They, they, right. They kind of brought something back to yeah. life that probably should have just faded away. Well, and I would have a problem if the president were to try and implement some policy or tell the NFL yes. that, what what they should do exactly. Here's the thing: he wasn't. He was responding in an interview with Brian Kilmeade when asked about the NFL's policy. Perfectly right. appropriate. Perfectly appropriate. They said, "What do you think about this new policy? Why? Because it's been politicized a lot. It's a big issue." Yeah. And he answered with his opinion. That's why Donald Trump is actually gaining popularity. And this is one thing I will say. I'm not the guy who says you can never trust polls. Right now, you can't trust polls on whether you have a favorable or unfavorable view of Trump because people feel they need to have an unfavorable view. Right. I don't think many people are that offended by what he said there. And he, th the fact that the media is acting as though he was somehow like a king dictating what the NFL should do is why no one trusts them. Yeah. Well, and a lot of the players, I read a lot of their responses to this on Twitter. They're saying that they have the right to go ahead and do this. They can, they can do this. It's not about the national anthem. They right. don't understand that they are disrespecting the national anthem by protesting during it. Well, that's what they're missing. Well, you know what they're, yes, yes, that's a good by, point. By choosing to protest during that, they're disrespecting Listen, the, This the country is imperfect, right? They're talking yeah, about the injustice. This country is imperfect, there is injustice. I, I think everyone here would agree with it. Just look at Sven Computer trying to, when he was trying to get his work visa. We may, we st we may still lose him for two still years. Abuse me. Hashtag save Sven, but don't follow him. So it's, <laughs> it's imperfect, you can protest, and you can strive to correct the imperfections. We do that on this yeah. show all the time. We're constantly criticizing our government and our media. We're constantly criticizing the establishment. I have no problem with that. The kneeling at the NFL is not about that yeah. it's not a if it's it's not a, if you don't like America get the hell out kind of reaction this is about goofy dumb dumb players trying to make a political statement on the dime of the viewers who've paid them to play football right this is the unwritten contract between the viewer and the football player they're tuning in precisely because it is a political it should be a sporting event and worse it's a protest predicated on a lie this is what bothers most yeah. Americans we've done a whole video I think we even have people here of us going through each and every Black Lives Matter case it was 20 something right yeah. not KJ we do all of those those things. And yeah. I think all of them, except for maybe two, which were like, okay, we'll give you those proven to be fraudulent. But it, it, here's the thing, it's like drinking from a fire hose. There are so many, these people are saying, we're kneeling until there's justice because police brutality. All right, well, let's just go through the stories from the last month, okay? Just this last month. May 22nd, okay? The body cam video revealed that Sharita Dixon Cole, remember that name, the black woman from Texas, lied about being raped by a cop who pulled her over for DUI. That was trending for wow. about a day. May 14th, the NAACP president in South Carolina, I think it was G uh, Gerard Moultrie, if it's pronounced, said that he was racially profiled and the body camera footage showed otherwise. May 10th, Remember this was the black woman named Dawn Hilton Williams from South Carolina? She created yeah. this, this tearful video claiming that she was harassed by a white cop during a traffic stop because she was black. Body cam footage revealed none of that happened. So it's oh, like, you, you know, want the body camera footage? <laughs> you want to be the world's most powerful genie? Everything that comes with it. No! <laughs> now all your claims go away. Oh, Who knows? Know, <laughs> <laughs> That's the entire Black Lives uh, Movement. Oh, Dang it. Mm, body this, cams. This is just right. last month. <laughs> you probably don't even remember. We've yeah. talked. Corin Gaines, Michael Brown, uh, Tamir Rice. All these other cases so we've written about at loudwithcredit.com. 
But they were all trending. They were all under the narrative of police brutality that you're, by the way, you're actually more likely to be shot by the police if you're a, you're a white guy. People white. don't understand yeah. this. Okay, this is something, we've written about that the website. People have said, I don't believe that statistic. Well, okay, go to the website, look at the that's, FBI that's, crime statistics. That's when adjusted for, for population. It's when adjusted for population. Not, yeah, and we covered it in numbers. detail on the show. <laughs> and, and so this is the protest based on a lie. That's the problem, is a protest on someone else's dime based on a lie because you're an idiot. And by, sometimes they say, well, it's not about police brutality, I think Colin Kaepernick said. It's, it's about the, 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 the basis of the United, it's ba built on slavery. It's built, the United States was built off the backs of slaves. First off, okay, you're not exactly eating exclusively shellfish while being bowl in the hull of a boat, Mr. 20 million a year Amistad, okay? Let's start with that. <laughs> They're so far Second removed from slavery. But so at what point do you say, all right, listen, maybe there were, there were, some, there were some bad breaks before, but now you've kind of had a leg up. <laughs> Namely, fantastic genetics that allow you to run like the wind and set one through 25 speed records, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Second, is it even true? And jumping, right? Mm. Is it even true? Was the United States built on slavery? We're told that so much. You so hear you, that all the time, yeah. You hear it all the time. All the time, and nobody challenges it. No. The truth is the free North outperformed the slave state South in, in nearly every economic way imaginable. Yeah. Well, and, and it's many economists actually attributed it to directly to long established economic detriment of slavery. So if you're a slave, you have zero incentive to come up with new ways of doing things, to be more productive. Basically, you're just going to keep your head down in a bad situation and not get hurt, right? Exactly. So it's never going to change. It would still be the same way today if we didn't if we didn't change. No, I think and I think Sun Peter had a quote there, right? Was it from the? Uh... Yeah, I mean, I mean, you can read the quote right here. If, I mean, if you're if you are one of those slave owners, people, if you're not living really in a free market, and you're not really trying to compete as it was a free market, so right. you're living more for the pomp and not to S in innovate and stuff. Slavery would have much more in common with Marxism, which is what I always find yes. so funny, like this capitalist society off of. Really? Okay. Well, the whole idea of capitalism is to incentivize people to benefit benefit from their labor, to benefit from what they create. Guess what you have? Guess what your pot of gold is at the end of a rainbow if you're a slave and you do a fantastic job? Damn it, more slavery! <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna get an underground railway to Canada and Canadians go, oh, look, great, no, more slaves, bring them over, bring them over. Bring <laughs> there was no, in, there's no incentive to be entrepreneurial or scientific. That is why, yeah. that's why you go, well, hold on a second. What's the correlation here? Because almost every measurable economic facet here, the North did better than the South yeah. without slaves. There you go. Is that, why, is that why they won the war? Or was it just because they had a little less than enthusiastic troops in the South? And cooler hats. Cooler hats. <laughs> that might have been it, too. <laughs> I don't think that's I mean, I mean, we have this image of, 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 of the cotton-picking South, but the truth is that only after slavery had ended did the cotton industry actually soar right. and innovate. And there's a strong argument to be made that that was due to technological advancements, which came after slaves were gone. This happens in almost every business. Think yeah. like, Nearly anyone who runs a business or is a CEO, if you look at stories today, these success stories, it's someone who started their way at the bottom. Carly Fiorina is an example that comes to mind. Yeah. Um, they started their way to the bottom, and they learned every. They came to the top. Why? Because they spoke with the boss and said, hey, I think you could be doing this better. I think this could be more efficient. Why would you do that if you're a slave? You wouldn't. They were impeded by it. There's a reason the best cars don't come from the Middle East where they have endless slave labor available to them. Right. Exactly. Innovation doesn't exactly breed innovation. No, it does you not. Build pyramids and all, but that's about it. Yeah, I think that was the aliens. The point is, <laughs> no one today. Nailed it. By the way, also, hey, Gerald, do me a favor. Right now, jump up. Just jump up. Jump. No, give me an actual jump. What do you want to jump for? Jump. He landed in the same spot. There's no round earth. It's flat, it's flat, it's flat. We're not rotating. So the point is that uh, YouTube video, 5 million plays. You can't disprove it. The point is no one today, okay, out there needs to feel guilty of their privilege because of slavery. It was horrible. Listen, absolutely terrible. But thank God we ended it. And thank God that it's not what actually made this country. In a lot of ways, it's what held us back. So you can speak morally slavery, bad, thank God we ended it. And then intellectually, you can look at it, you can look at the statistics, you can look at the difference between the North and the South, you can look at innovation, you could look at slave nations, some of which still exist today, not exactly the pinnacle of innovation, and say, that's not what made this country. It held us back. So maybe the fact that these people right now who are protesting don't know anything about police brutality statistics, maybe the fact that they don't know, it, maybe they don't do any due diligence on the Black Lives Matter charlatans, maybe the fact that they actually don't know anything about the United States and slavery or the history could also explain why they're under this asinine impression that anyone is, quote, kneeling to Trump. Trump's not a king. Trump did not issue an executive order commanding anyone to kneel. The NFL made a policy because contrary to the media, the American citizens don't live in a monolith. And with their dollars, with their viewership, they voted to send you a message, NFL players, that they're tired of your uneducated, self-important protest bullshit.
at a football game. So the NFL, the owners, the organizers responded out of necessity for survival of the league. And the president responded when asked about this policy specifically. This is exactly why the president is so popular with anyone who's not a dynamo leftist. Millions of middle male Americans say, you know, I really think it's disrespectful. I think it's disrespectful to kneel during, uh, during the anthem at a football game. Then dumbass NFL players, activists, and their lackeys in the media either blatantly or passively accuse said middle Americans of being white supremacists. Then all of a sudden Trump, all he has to do is say, you know, I don't think they should kneel. And so millions of Americans breathe a sigh of relief and go, oh, okay, see, I'm not a white supremacist. I'm, not a white supremacist. I'm just a veteran. <laughs> I'm just a veteran who respects our flag. And so the media now has one of two choices. Either start telling the truth and admit that maybe they were wrong, that maybe there's a cultural divide, maybe there's some disagreement, or double down and not just call you, middle America, white supremacists, but run with a narrative, of course, that Donald Trump is a white supremacist. So they have to make that choice. And which do you think they do? Exactly. We'll be back after this with Ralph Macchio. There it is again, so strong. It puts the mug in the basket. Huh? It puts the mug in the basket. It does whatever it's told. Huh? It places the mug in the basket. I I just can't really... Put the mug in the basket! Huh? It puts the mug in the basket or it gets the hose again. Put the mug in the basket! 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 who danced for us to Pogo. Can you believe this? We didn't even show it to the audience. Usually the comedian or something, someone who's, you know, opening up for someone at, at Hilarities in Cleveland. It's true. And they feel they have to dance to impress the audience. But our next one, uh, he really needs no introduction, but we're going to introduce him anyway. Of course, star of the new show, Cobra Kai. Biggest hit ever on the YouTube Red. Uh, at Ralph Macchio, C-C-H-I-O. Mr. Macchio, thank you for being here, sir. Great to be here. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Oh, I am absolutely thrilled to have you. I mean, uh, you know, we have people on the show every now and then who listen. I tell them, I say I read their book. I don't really read their book. And then... Right. Uh, <laughs> you read the first page. Yeah, exactly. First and last page. Right. I have the cliff notes, and I determine whether I like it based on that. Um, but I grew up watching you. Karate Kid, that was, I mean, that was my jam as far as a film. And now Cobra Kai, I think we have some B-roll here from Cobra Kai. For people who have not seen it, you need to join up at YouTube Red. Um, it's the biggest show. Their numbers are incredible uh, for people who don't know. It's the biggest hit. I mean, it's, it's among Netflix, Hulu, every, it's huge out there. W w what's this been like for you coming back after so long with this franchise and uh, the wonder of the internet to reintroduce this in a way that's been very positively received? Well, it, listen, it's exceeded uh, my expectations. I mean, I knew going in, uh, I felt really confident. These three, uh, three creators of the show um, were just they, the guys who sort of they they created uh, Harold and Kumar franchise and, and Hot Tub Time Machine and they they sat me down and I was the last one to come to the party because I've always been quite uh, quite protective of that character in the franchise and I've said no for thirty years it feels like and I have because everyone says how about this how about that how an about idea this? Daniel Larusso like, nah. in a Shark Tank. That's right. That's what he is. Or maybe a, a, you know Rocky Balboa had a kid and met up with him. So <laughs> I mean, you have no idea. But more gender neutral because it's 2018. <laughs> we'll just we'll do a little right. whitewash. That's right. That's right. Of course. But uh, um, so these guys had such a, a clear vision of what they wanted to do, and um, and the the groundswell response, sort of the build up to it, and how YouTube handled the promotional elements and sort of sneaking stuff out slowly and. People kind of snickered, maybe t took, had their arms crossed a little bit. Okay, this is another one of those. 
And uh, it is not. It's a very much its own unique take on a classic franchise. Um, we're very proud of it. The audiences are just running to it. And they're, the coolest part is everyone's just telling their friends and their cousins and their kids. And, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, you really have the nostalgia. It feeds the nostalgia part of us that you sort of grew up with that film. And yet has a very fresh, relevant take on that's, bullying and that's what I was going to say. It's, it's not the Fuller younger. House of martial arts. No, it's not. It's not the Fuller no, House of not martial not arts. <laughs> it's like wah, 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 how wood? Yeah, but the speech impediment is yeah, not cute. Right. You're Ooh, 45. Um, no, <laughs> right. I, I, I told, and we have hundreds of emails now and, and thousands of tweets from audience members because I said, listen, you really need to go watch Cobra Kai. It's one of the few shows out there that is a wink and a nod to what it used to be. And you know, this nostalgia obviously induces incredible nostalgia, but it writes for what it is in today's era. And not in a corny way. It does it in a no. way that is congruent with the characters. I don't want to say anti-hero at all, but some of the at some points the role I don't want spoiler alert, some points the roles are a little changed between you and and Johnny. Um, and that's what's great. It has it touches on, you know, the karate kid was clearly a film that was was uh was built on, on the on the uh you know, good over evil. Black. It was very black and white. And this this show has a lot of gray areas. Your allegiance week to week, or week to week, is funny. You can binge watch it. Yeah, exactly. Episode to episode. Right. Yeah. I'm still old school. No, it's head's still it's twinkie to twinkie. But when you reach for a new vertical row, right. when you reach it's time for another. ring ding, you're fine. Yes. But it goes, it goes uh, the allegiance switches, and, and there's sort of a moral ambiguity at times, even in, in the high school world characters, and certainly in the Daniel LaRusso, Johnny Lawrence characters. And I think that freshness and that... Uh, uh, angle in makes it unique, yet it still uh, pays homage to to the source material. Yeah, it, you know? it really is. Well, I I can't recommend it enough. And people give us so much flack because for the film reviews, like, you don't like anything. It's like, no, I just didn't like Thor three. Okay, so sorry. Right. <laughs> um, but one thing I w I will say uh, here with uh, with with Cobra Kai is um. Well, I, I, I'm trying to see what I can say without spoiling anything. Mm. Uh, it's very, very hard. Did you see the YouTube mm -hmm. video, by the way? Because some, some pe there's a sort of conspiracy thread. The YouTube video, da uh, Daniel LaRusso was the bully. Did you ever see that? Right, right. Yeah, yeah the, illegal, the illegal kick, the yes. one, one move. That it, was, he, it was pretty he, funny. It was well done. The guy did a great job because he did a very classic breakdown style of, right. of, of, of um, you know, watch watch this punch while he wasn't looking and watch how he just innocently took away. Um, I think I the best part about that, because people ask me about it all the time, um, uh, I, the best part about it is it's like 34 years later and people are still making videos about it. Right. Um, and this is before Cobra Kai came out. It's like, I love the fact that it's a conversation, that the groundswell of justice for Johnny exists right. although yes. daniel russo is clearly you know that that underdog character that we all root for he was a piece of all our childhoods you know and, we, yeah. and none of that gets taken away what cobra guy just adds to that and and um, let me ask do you feel and, partially and, and really responsible for all of the asses that were kicked in the school ground from the kids who tried to fight off the bully with a crane kick there's got to be right, some yeah, part right. of <laughs> it's, it's my fault that this, this <laughs> yeah. never really worked in, in the world, but it was genius on film it was genius uh, on film uh, um, let me, let me, I do want to bring something, not to be a kiss ass here, but this is one thing. I think people get caught up in the in the franchise and Karate Kid, and you have obviously you have such people look at your catalog, so much work, um, that sometimes it's overlooked how great of an actor you are. And there's a scene that I've always thought, and I've talked about it on this show. I'd like to roll a clip. There's a scene in Karate Kid, the first Karate Kid, and I've told people because we've talked about you know James Dean, Rebel Without a Cause, and East of Eden, this sort of portrayal of teen angst. I think this scene where you're talking to your mother after being beaten up by bullies is possibly the most genuine feeling portrayal of teen angst, confusion, desperation. I'd like to roll a clip and then get your thoughts afterward. Let's see this. Bike. Bike. Dude, I hate it. Daniel, what's the matter? Nothing. Why did you throw your bike away? Because I felt like Please, it, Mom. look at me when I'm talking to you. Oh my God. Mom. Oh, oh my God. Would you tell me what's going on here and don't tell me about another bike accident? What do you want to hear, Ma? The truth. No, you don't want to hear the truth. All you want to hear is how great it is out here. Well, it may be great for you, but it sucks for me. I hate this place. I hate it. I just want to go home. Why can't we just go back home? Wait, listen to me. What? I cannot help you unless you tell me what's wrong. I gotta take karate. That's it. You took karate. No, not in the, not at not the Y. In a good school. Fighting doesn't solve anything. Oh well, neither does palm trees, ma. That's not fair. Yeah, well, like it was fair coming out here without asking me how I felt about it, right? That was really fair. You're right. 
I should have asked. Yeah, well, I just want to go home. That's it. I don't understand the Daniel, rules here. Yeah, I want to go home. Up. So for people who don't know what they're watching, that's a one shot. That's one long. It is shot. one is one 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 steady cam shot. And the great John Avelson, our director, um, uh, you know, go, go ahead. Well, I'm sorry. I, 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 it's always uncomfortable. But this is it's such a great job for people who don't know what they're watching, because a lot of people they just watch films. and They see it from an entertainment standpoint. That's one shot. You're conveying a lot of different emotions, anger to helplessness to desp wanting to go to a karate school, the, the losing it in your voice. I mm. always watch that scene and say, people don't realize how well performed the scene. How many takes did that take? And how did you get into that headspace? Because it really is something uh, incredible to watch. Well, first of all, thank you very much. And it was nice to, it was even nice to just revisit that audio wise, um, because, uh, you know, we watched this film a, a bunch of time over, over the years. Uh, that's the great Randy Heller also playing uh, Mrs. LaRusso, who uh, right. is a nice, without making spoilers, it's a nice <laughs> Easter egg, and I just gave it away right, yeah. in our series. Um, and we're hoping to uh, to have, have that role and other actors from back then, uh, back in, in the future of the Cobra Kai show. The You know, the scene, we did it a bunch of times. Uh, some of it was because the camera, you know, some of it was on me, some of it was on... Uh, the camera, you know, we didn't get it perfect each every single time. And I think if I you actually watch that take, if you really analyze it, there's one point where the steady cam just does a little bit of a oh. of a of a wobble. Am I there? It should be back. There we go. Back. Okay, there. there's that wonderful point. Okay, so continue. You were saying the, the the camera got a little crooked. Right. So the camera got a little a little um, you know it had a little wobble in it. And and by technical perfection standards, you would say, hmm, let's go again. We have a little bit of. But the performance credit the director, um, you know, you go with, you always go with performance because that stuff falls away. Right. You know, that stuff you don't notice. Um, I think that that, that scene did have a, have a lot of levels. I mean, the whole, I hate this bike, this stupid bike. That was all John Avelson saying, when you walk up, you know, I think he was trying to help me get to that level. Yeah. And he had me walk down and keep throwing, he said, just keep throwing it in there. He said, go back, do it again. And he had the camera rolling and I, I had to do it like three and four times, sometimes per take, just pick it up. So when it they said, take it out again and do it again. And he was, I think what he was doing, I'm sure what he was doing was getting me to that right. place of, uh, of frustration and build all that level of emotion. Um, the, the line when he says, not at, not, at, not, at, not at the Y at a real school was basically Ralph Macchio forgetting the line <laughs> and, and figuring it out. As yeah, I'm going, at a good at, school. I know what it says. And uh, so that, that. You know what's uh, funny? We quote that in our house all the time. When I was a kid, like if we had a problem or something, I'd be like, I got to take karate, ma, not at the Y yeah. at a good school. And it was, That's just, right. no, it was it's, sort it's of a line great. in the house. I think it's it's a it's a credit to all of us working together. A well written scene, a fantastic director, a beautiful and and wonderful actress to play opposite. We had a great chemistry together, and um, and it's just one of those that uh, that we caught on film. You know, it doesn't always happen, so it's nice. I and really yourself, respect. look how humble you are. That was still that was. I know, but I did a good job. You did a great job with that. I mean, I, I when I was a kid, I watched it. I remember everything else kind of happening, and me going, "Oh, rewind it." And I was transfixed because I was always watching the performance side of it and going, "This is just." And you went stop telling Ben Shapiro about it when you met him. That's right. Know, I met uh, Ben Shapiro. Actually, lived I think in the in the home next door to where they shot that. Uh, right. Where they shot where you were, and I was like, "Ben, this is where they shot Karate Kid." Uh, <laughs> and he, 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 it's it great. So Thank good. you very much. I, I, it's uh, it feels good to to hear that and gain that compliment and know what you know. That was the birth of everything uh, uh, that moved uh, from that point. You well, know, it was very of, very of birth, I have one question, yeah. and again, everyone go watch Cobra Kai YouTube Red. But this is this is somewhat unrelated. Uh, and I see the poster behind you, so I'm happy. There's an easy segue. The outsiders. Yeah. Oh yeah. There, yeah. Um, as far as I'm concerned, this should be c casting 101 for people who don't know, who haven't seen it. You've got. Ralph Macchio, Patrick Schwayze, Rob Lowe, Emilio Estevez, C. Thomas Holt, Diane Lane, Matt Dillon, Tom Cruise. I'm sure I'm missing some. Uh, as far as I know, before any of them were stars, it might have been their first actual main role in some of these films. Unbel and, and you all went on to be marquee names. Were you aware were you were, when you were on that set, like, oh, he's going to be a multi-million dollar star. Oh, she is. Oh, he is. Or was it just... No, I mean, we didn't. We all felt like we were. Right, yes. <laughs> we all... Back then, we all did. I mean, Matt Dillon had a few uh, films at the time. Right, that's right. My um, Bodyguard, I and, think. Yeah, and all that. Yeah, and, yeah. My Body. I think yes, yes. And uh, Over the Edge was his first one. And I, and then I think uh, Tom Cruise just had. He was just in Taps with Timothy Hutton. That's right. Uh, and George C. Scott. So he was. Um, and Leif Garrett was probably the biggest star on the set. It's true. You, you know. 
with his uh, music uh, career and everything else. And and Diane Lane, obviously, she started really young. And, you know, obviously, we're all on the set with Diane Lane just to, to this day. She's just a, a beautiful human being and a good, terrific actress. I think we, you know, we had hopes we were in a movie directed by Francis Ford Coppola and uh, based on a classic young adult novel that we all read. I read when I was 12 years old. Yeah. The Outsiders, for me, was... The first, like you know, it's the first. It's your first love. It's the first kiss. You never forget it. It was a great role. I love that part. It holds a special place. I still go around and at certain times go to the middle schools and talk to the school classes that just read the book. A lot of the guys do that. Yeah. A lot of the guys do that, and it's um, it's a great one to be a part of. It really is. It really is. I remember I read it. I had Mr. Rooney in the seventh grade, and I remember he kicked me out of class because I said the socks when I first read it. Said, the socks. socks. Well, everyone did. So did I. Yeah, but he kicked me out of class and he called my father. He called my father and said, you know, your son is a 12-year-old who thinks he's a 13-year-old. And my dad said, <laughs> okay, I'll bite. It means he thinks he knows more than he does. And I was like, this guy teacher was out of his mind. Uh, but I remember reading The Outsiders. And it's one of the last classics that I think I read. Everything else was just mm -hmm. sort of, you know, experimental. People don't read the classics in college anymore in high school. I read right. Some, like, didn't read Naomi Wolf. Yeah, read Naomi Wolf. Well, it helped. I mean, S.E. Hinton for my, uh, my generation, with you know, jump-started my reading and and uh, so many young readers uh, it, like jk rowling did written with the harry potter books you know where every kid you had to read it you know don't bring up the harry potter books because my wife is going to be watching this in the green room she's going to run on in i had to take her to harry potter world she's a giant nerd fan and we will derail this whole conversation okay, I didn't mean that. I mean, <laughs> no 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 but this has been just trying to make a parallel i, a I, I get it you actors, you all speak allegorically. Can you just <laughs> come down in our level? Uh, Mr. Macho, I know you're a busy man. We actually have Martin Cove coming up after this, so different side. Ah, of you got the, the Darth Vader of the 80s. Coming, coming um, and, but, uh, yeah, it's great. He's, he's excited, too, for the, you know, for everything going on. I mean, he, you know, was the king, yeah. Cobra Kai king, so... Uh, well, I'm looking uh, forward nice. to season really two. Nice. And looking forward to season... And I'm just, I'm hoping and praying. You know, there's always that season two. You're like, please don't see get season I two. I know, that sophomore jinx, right? Yeah. I think we really have... I just spoke to the, the three writers the other day, and, you know, uh, it's important that we pick up right where we left off and forget all this... You know, don't read the press as great as it is. I've never experienced anything that has like 100% on Rotten Tomatoes and 35 million views. And it's really been incredible yeah. that, that how how much of a hit this has become. But we really have to pick up where we left off and 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 uh, and stay focused and and charged in that way. As focused as a Miyagi is in Poria. Yeah. Um, so we, you know, we continue to be smart and push the envelope, but yet... Um, give that big, fat, warm embrace, that nostalgic embrace that people are feeling by, by watching the show. And we'll have Martin Coban. He has something, 200-something credits to his name. The one thing I will say, it's, it's hard to bring a series back often or you do a reunion because you're like, oh my gosh, they look like that. Now, ev all of you, these the main portions of the cast, like you said, those who are still with us, continued to flex the muscle, continued to work. And so uh, it really does work. It's a great show. I highly recommend it. Mr. Macchio, at Ralph Macchio on the Twitter. Thank you so much, man. I know you're- Awesome. Thanks, thanks for having me. This is a lot of fun. Yeah, thanks. absolutely. Absolutely. We'll go. Uh, we'll talk with uh, Martin, and we'll talk with you soon. Thank you, sir. Louder with Crowder Studios, protected exclusively by Walther. It's the one live read of the week to well, one and a half this week. Uh, like we said earlier, YouTube's changing the subscription algorithm. There didn't mm -hmm. used to be a subscription algorithm. So if you're watching this on YouTube, please bookmark the channel or join. We really do need your support at loudwithcredit.com slash mug club. 15 people uh, work on this show. You get the show every single day and access to all of the CRTV catalog for $99 annually, 69 for students, veterans, active military, and uh, there's a 30-day free trial. So if you can't do that, but you are in the market for a gun, we do want to feature, of course, our sponsor, Walther, uh, the Lotto Crowder, Lotto Crowder Studios is protected exclusively, exclusively by Walther. This is their PPQ, Google Walther PPQ trigger. You won't find anything uh, better than this firearm out there. You won't find a single negative review. It's all glowing. Just not a lot of people have really heard about Walther. They don't have the same big marketing budget. Then, Nakia Jared, of course, we always talk about, I always say keep it simple. If you're looking to buy a firearm, if you're not getting a revolver, you're getting a semi-automatic 9 millimeter, and if you get a couple, keep them in the same caliber so that it's pretty easy to stock up on ammo. Easy and, and good, easy to find. Right. And most concealable from Walther is the, the Walther PPS, PPS M2. This right. is not loaded. loaded. Uh, uh, and this is the one, the Crimson Trace M2 with the the, uh, the laser. Highly recommend it. And then uh, Randy, actually, someone, one of my coaches, I was speaking with him, he said, well, what would you do if you were to get one? So I'm going to pull out here. This is actually the Walther 
PPS, sorry, the PPQ, I don't know if you can get a close up on there. That's the PPQ subcompact. And what is this? It's shorter than this. It's about the same width and length. Sorry, not the same width, same length as the, uh, the PPS, but with twice the capacity. It has a 10 plus one capacity, or you can put in a full capacity. So you lose a little bit of the barrel. If you're only going to have one firearm that you want to conceal, you want to have high capacity to protect your home, the Walter PPQ subcompact awesome. is wow. really an awesome firearm. The way to go. And guess what? Right now, I'll tell you this. We're kind of redoing the way people uh, advertise sponsors. This is a slide belt. They're not a sponsor. I just like their slide belt. These are barbell jeans. They're not a sponsor. I just like barbell jeans. Uh, Walther has the balls to sponsor the show. Yep. So when you're looking to pick a, a quality firearm out there, we know there are a lot of firearms out there that are good. There are other. I own plenty of different kinds of firearms. Walther is every bit as good, in most facets I would say better, certainly the trigger, and they have the guts to sponsor this show. So if you want to support the show, want to keep the sponsors going, and you don't join Mug Club, if you're going to buy a gun, just go to the, go to the range, try the Walther. Let's go. That's perfect, because our next guest, we just had, we just had Ralph on. Yep. Good guy, Ralph. Though actually, there's there's a change of roles at Cobra Kai for people who haven't watched it on uh, on YouTube Red. And uh, our next next guest is known as Crease, mm -hmm. the bad guy. Often you can follow him on the Twitter at Martin Cove. He has something like two hundred and I want to say two hundred fifty credits to his name. If you look, he, he shows up everywhere. You think he's running to Clint Howard at some point? I, 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 we should ask him. We should he, ask him. He, almost the catalog of Clint Howard, but he doesn't have to, he doesn't have to be Clint Howard. So you know he has, so he has that <laughs> going for him. But Clint, uh, Clint, we'll have you on soon again, brother. Uh, Mr. Cove, thank you for being on, sir. Thank you, thank you. By the way, Clint Howard, I killed him on Gunsmoke in my first year in Hollywood. <laughs> well, who among us? Are we talking hasn't? about the same Clint that was the, is the father of Ron Howard? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, Clint is no, he's brother. Yeah, Ron Howard's brother. Brother, brother, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, killed him a couple of times in a couple of movies. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. He's, pretty much if Clint Howard's in a movie, you're writing around the death scene. <laughs> but uh, we brought him in and he did a sketch with us where he actually played Susan Wojcicki, the, the CEO of YouTube, because we, we needed an actor. And we're like, Clint, you could do this. So we dressed him up. And uh, I remember directing him. Oh, I got to tell you, Mr. Cup, it was very hard. He was very, uh, it was a very long, arduous process. And I said, this is going to be terrible. And then when I looked at the rushes, I said, this is amazing. This is, he's a guy who really knows how he registers on camera. Um, and I was, that leads into you. You've, you often play the villain, right? This is no secret to you. I know you're a nice, are, are you a nice guy? I, should, I shouldn't lead the witness. I, I cry at supermarket openings. Okay, okay. <laughs> 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 that might be disturbed. I don't know that that's necessarily nice. <laughs> Uh, but you seem like, but you often play the bad guy. Now you're one of the few guys out there who is disrespectfully like is good looking enough to still play the tough bad guy. You know, you're like you're 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 ruggedly tough. And I noticed you have the Clint Eastwood, and I don't know if that's I can't see the one Coburn behind you. Did yeah, you there you go. Oh, there you go. Okay. Did you Six for dollars and the good, the bad, and the ugly? There you go. Okay. Per Did Those you are my theme songs. <laughs> yes. Did you set out to do this? Did you say okay? I think I'm probably going to be able to do the bad guy role really well, or did it just happen organically? No, I guess it just happened organically, really. I, I, you know, I have an eight-month-old grandchild, and if I don't see him every day, I cry. Yeah. You know, I mean, I just love this baby. But, you know, you're strong, featured, and you, I love the physical. When I did Gunsmoke in the first year I was in Hollywood, it was heaven because you got a chance to do, you know, work with James Arness and all. And the bottom line is I loved Westerns. But when you're starting out, you do heavies. You just do. Right. I mean, unless you're looking like Gregory Peck, who never did a heavy. Gregory Peck started out with leading men in the late 30s, you know? Yeah. And there's some people that just go right into it. And I didn't, like so many of my you know, good friends. And you just, you know, it's sort of like you, you create a, a staple of those roles. And I think for young actors, bringing up anger and toughness is probably the easiest emotion to call upon. Mm. Because when you're young... You kind of, you know, touching the vulnerability and doing what Mel Gibson does in all his movies. It's and a lot harder. So it, um, yeah, and his voice, <laughs> <that's> right? <laughs> you have no soul. Uh, I always. Yes. Uh, it's the reason I find those so funny is because I always would talk. I, I say the honest, I'm like, oh come on. All of you are judging this guy in a private voicemail, a private argument. You have had that rage, even if internally at some point. Let let you who has not felt that way cast the first stone. Well, let me. Let me ask you this: so You've done so many roles. Is this is the is Crease still the role you think you're most recognized for? Certainly now with Cobra Kai, but is that the one people connect to most? Do you think? Yeah, that. And when I did, I followed up the original Karate Kid with Rambo: First Blood Part Two. Yeah. And and I was doing six years on Cagney Lacey, so <clears throat> a lot of them remember that. 
oddly enough, many people are big fans of the last house on the left, which is a very yeah. bizarre cult movie, which was Wes Craven's first film. I personally, you know, don't understand that, but you know, it was like <laughs> 1972. And the other one, which is a cult movie, which also surprises me, is one that Stallone and I did, you know, prior to Rambo, which was um, Death Race 2000. Yes. Yeah. And you wouldn't believe how many people, you know, just remember those parts. And, you know, you were playing a crazy, you were playing, a, like you say, a tough guy. It was the early parts of your career. Yeah. You know, and um, and I think that y y you try to graduate. You know, when I did Katie and Lacey, I, I kind of stopped doing uh, bad guys because I played him as a macho. You know, he, right. he kind of didn't like women being detectives, but he had a lovable quality about him. And I kept trying to graduate into that area and not do any more of wise guys and tough guys. I think, I you, think know. you mentioned Last House on the Left. I think that was one of the few move films that Wes Craven remade himself. I think Wes Craven remade the Wes Craven because there's a recent one. And I don't know yeah. if it was Jennifer Lawrence. But uh, I appreciate your candor with that. You know, Clint Howard, a good friend of the show, he's on all, has made a living off of cult films. Remember, he was on the show and he goes, you know, some of the trash I've done, is, I mean, it's borderline unwatchable. Because <laughs> he's done so many. He's like, what, what does I help if I want, you know? Um, practically pornography. It's pornography <laughs> of the lazy mind. Um, <laughs> but uh, let, let me ask you this. Have you seen, obviously, because you've been around for so many decades now in the, in the film and entertainment industry, and it's changed. Uh, radically, where we've kind of come full circle. I talked about this before. Remember, they, uh, they used to say, we'll never have, we'll never have the numbers that, you know, we used to have on with Carson. And granted, that's probably true. But then American Idol was 30-something million. They said, we'll never have those numbers again. You know, The Voice was lucky to get maybe 15 million um, because cable became so spread out. But now we're sort of back to a few main networks with YouTube, Netflix, Hulu, Amazon and HBO, and you're getting these numbers. There's a season of a lot more less famous people. Yes, yeah, for a while. there was for a while. But now you've come full circle, and, and Cobra Kai is getting those kinds of numbers that people thought you would never see again. Uh, what's it like to, to, to be a part of that whole transition and back again? Well, as I said earlier, you and I talked, the writing yeah. and the extraction of the great values from Karate Kid. Karate Kid 1 was a religious experience for so many people. You know, you either were bullied in that period of time and you identify with that. You had a love affair that didn't work out as a high school student or you were fish out of water, you know, and most of the people we've experienced have had one of those things going on in their life when they saw Karate Kid. And I think that, you know, the writing that brings in all of the, the fantastic values of the movie into the series is what's making the series work. Yeah, because all those all those extractions, the moments, the the feelings, the 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 emotions from the kids of what they're experiencing yeah. on the show is what Ralph experienced back in the day of 1983 when we made the movie. Right. So I think it's highly identifiable. They've chosen the right you know the right experiences to recreate on a weekly basis, and that's what's really selling. You know, it's a show that just like Ed Sullivan in, in its day the family can get around the TV and watch it. Right. And that's the, that's the value. Uh, it's the value, and that's why the numbers are so high. It's a family deal. Yeah. And it's, but it's a family deal 30 years later in a more active way. It, but it really does work. And we talk about this with, just with Ralph. You know, there, there are some gray areas. There, there, there is some, I, I wouldn't, but I wouldn't say moral ambiguities because there is redemption. That's kind of hard to do, to have a gray area, to have a bit of an anti-hero, but for there to still be moral redemption. Otherwise, you end up with some of the series out there that are just bleak for the sake of bleakness. Um, I don't want to, you know, no spoilers here. The people in the message boards will go absolutely nuts. But uh, you can see at one point, this guy seems like the good guy. Well, then maybe... Maybe you're not so sure, but there is no moral ambiguity about making the right decisions. And I think that's why it works. I think people are craving that a little bit. What I learned from the original Karate Kid when I was young was that all bad guys had dirt bikes. That's what I thought <laughs> when I watched it. I was like, he has a dirt bike. He must be a teenager. <laughs> I know it's a dirty word as a kid. But um, right. Mr. Mr. Cope, we don't have a, a ton of time here because Ralph went over time. Talk with him being a little bit of a diva. Uh, but where's the best place for people <laughs> to find you? What should people be looking out for next along with Cobra Kai? Well, we just did. Um, we're, we're doing a little comedy now with um, Barry Bostwick. But primarily, we're going off June 8th. I go off to um, Illinois 
to do a, a very exciting picture about Gettysburg. And there was a character who was 69 years old named John Burns, who in history literally fought in Gettysburg because he lived in Gettysburg and he became a hero and he, he met Lincoln. And it's all, you know, very, it's all nonfiction. Yeah. So it's all brilliant stuff. And it's always fun to play someone who's nonfiction. And I believe you said that uh, your son will be acting. You've acted in a, quite a few films with your son now. So is, that must be nice to be able to pass the torch. It's the best. You know, Jesse Cove is the best. Yes. You know, he's doing a part in there and we meet on the field of Gettysburg and I'm, you know, a guy who doesn't even have the right musket. And he gives me, you know, the bullets and everything circa 19, 18, 19, 1863. Yeah. Because I came out of war in 1812 and they wouldn't let me join. So I'm, you know, old, too old to fight. But it's really interesting, the values and how it affected the entire city of Gettysburg. The town was enormously affected by, you know, every every house was turned into a hospital. One moment for the Confederates, another for the Union soldiers. So it's 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 emotionally very very and historically a very very effective film, terrific story. I'm look I'm looking and forward I love to any historical. Yeah, I'm looking forward yeah, to it. There haven't good. been as many great Civil War films when you compare it to World War II or the Revolutionary War. Uh, it seems like it's it's a tough one to do sometimes because of obviously kind of the connotations here in the United States. So I'm looking forward to that. Of course, people can follow you at Martin Cove, Mr. Cove. Thank you for making time, sir. We appreciate it. Very good. You follow me at martincoveonline.com. But thank you very much. Oh, there we go. martincoveonline.com. We have to be back after this. I don't know who we have. Is it hot? Please? Maybe. Helicopter wheelchair that doesn't really work. Oh, that's disappointing. It just propels you the wrong you direction. Egg. You got a cracker bro, didn't yeah. you? Just ran Stephen Hawking straight into a building. Really, <laughs> really glad to have our next guest, who are apparently uh, broadcasting from, I think, uh, uh, a warehouse in Bangladesh. Uh, you can follow them at Hodge Twins, Hodge Twins Tour <laughs> They're going to be starting their European tour dates soon. Uh, the Hodge Twins, how are you, Keith and Kevin? We hanging in, man. It's, it's tough though, man. Why is it, why, why is it tough? <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. Life's great, man. No, tell them, tell them be honest, man. It's tough being black in America today. <laughs> Is it? I, have, I might have a blind yeah. spot. When you lean conservative, it's real tough for black people. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what about, uh, what about... Look what, they're doing, look what they're doing to Kanye. Look what they're doing to Candace. Yeah, black lives matter if you're not conservative. <laughs> That's true. Actually, I thought we were gonna we were gonna have Candace uh, on the show today, and uh, I think there was a miscommunication, or she missed it. So she's always welcome to come on the show. But uh, has she reached out to you, Candace Owens? Uh... I don't think we her speed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no, I guess not. I guess more more so more so Kanye. You know, so maybe you guys did cut a couple of albums and claim that you're the Black Jesus. You'll have something to offer. Um, Yes. What, 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 now, you've talked about how it's hard being a black conservative. See, you just used the word I didn't. What's your opinion here on that? We've talked about this before, the kneeling with the NFL. But obviously, Trump was asked a question about this. He was said, what do you think about Goodell's uh, the new policy? He said, OK, I think it's disrespectful to kneel. And the media acts as though it's this decree from President Trump to the NFL. Do, we were asking this to the audience, do you like the fact that he weighs in on some of these social cultural issues? Or do you think it's unpresidential? I think it's cool that he does it. He's just not too presidential when he does it. I just, I mean, he, he, he's not a politician. He's a businessman, and he yeah. never got. That. He knows that's bad for business, especially for the NFL. I just want to look at my football. Right. I'm looking at these fools kneeling. I think. I mean, it's your right to do so, but come on, man. You you got a brain. There's so many other constructive ways you can do to help bring awareness to police brutality why you got to go out of your way to offend people you know right. and it hurts your business that you that you're getting paid from so it's like yeah. i don't get it i'm well, glad he did 
Yeah, well, again, this goes back to Kaepernick, which if you guys have been accused of not being black enough, I mean, Kaepernick looks like someone you'd cut out of the Iran deal. I'm not entirely <laughs> sure. <laughs> what? Do you know the background? <laughs> no? I think he's just light-skinned, that's all. Oh, well, I don't know. Maybe just because well, he, he, he looks sinister. Bad. Yeah, he does look sinister. He does look like, yeah, I'm going to have a bad throwing average. Yeah. Like, what are you doing? Uh, are you did you Jafar uh, did, Jaf did, did Jafar sleep with one of the Cosby kids um let me ask you this you said you told me recently you guys were in Canada and I guess some uh, some fans of the show first off I'm glad they let you in and out of the country uh yeah. I don't think I'm allowed back but uh, you had some people approach you who are fans of this show and, and fans of uh, kind of your your sort of new newly expressed political opinions explain that yeah it's um uh, like right after our comedy show we have like a meet and greet mm -hmm. and uh a lot of people come to us and say, we found you guys on Crowder. That's yeah. the first words out of my mouth. That, and they say, um, bitch can't breathe. <laughs> <laughs> they always bring that up. Yeah. But yeah, uh, yeah we, we experienced that in all our shows, actually. Canada, yeah. when we was out there in London, got a lot of fans out there, too. Man. Yeah, we was in, uh, what was that, Calgary, our yeah. last show? It was a Trump supporter, female. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh, she dressed from head to toe in American flag. And she had to... Uh, Make America great again. <laughs> oh, yeah. But you know what? Nobody harassed her or anything. Nobody yeah. was disrespectful to her or, or anything. You know, I think they almost think it's it's a, it's a caricature at that point. I don't think they think it's real in Canada because there really there is no sort of Trump. There is it's no sort of like right wing. Kind of like you went into the uh, the gay bar dressed as Trump doing. Uh, yeah, they thought it was, when I did it. I went to a, sincere. Yeah, I went to a like, gay ah. bar at uh, in in Houston as Trump singing show tunes Hamilton, but flipping them the bird, telling them to kiss my ass, and they were cheering because I thought they're like, oh, this can't be real. So I think that's right. all of Canada. Canada's one big gay bar. <laughs> <laughs> Your thoughts? <laughs> Real touchy. He kept, uh, after the show was in the bar, he, he went to our show, he kept touching me. He said, man, you got some nice arms. I was like, um, quit touching me. <laughs> this is in Canada? This is in Canada. And his, uh, his girlfriend was right there. And she, this, this is just weird. Maybe they were swingers. <laughs> And you're twins, so you're right up there, Ali. If you could fit Morgan Freeman in there, you'd be the trifecta. Man, not Morgan Freeman. Man. Morgan, <laughs> Morgan no. Freeman, another good black man. <laughs> I don't want to use the term "good" too loosely there. He's, he, he's good. He's a good well, actor, man. Well, he, he seems wholesome, man. It, man, if Bill Cosby was bad, man, he was pudding pop guy, man. He was the most wholesome black dude we had. He was putting, he was putting women to sleep, man. <laughs> Crazy man, the pudding pop man, man. Yeah. I went back in the day when he first started. He was putting stuff in people's pudding pops, man. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> like, I think we're in uncharted territory here. All right. Well, I'm I'm glad they let you in and out of Canada, and I, I hope your shows are going well when you're doing live. You're going to be in Europe uh, soon. I know you've been in you were in Europe last year. When does this start? Oh man, it's it's starting in June. First, we're going to Dublin, Ireland. Okay. We're going to London. We're going to Manchester, UK. Calm we, down. Calm down. We, we, calm down, man. Calm we, down. Take shut, a breath. Calm we, down. Shut up. <laughs> then we're going to Leeds, UK. Then we're going to Manchester, Birmingham, Liverpool. Tell them Amsterdam, man. We're going to Amsterdam. Oh, no. That's Rotterdam. We're going to Rotterdam. That's the Netherlands. Tell, tell, them, tell them Sweden, man. Then we're going to Sweden. Did, we you, going, tell them, did you tell them Ireland? <laughs> We're going to Norway, and then we're going to Glasgow. That's in Scott. Hey, I think you forgot to tell him about the United Kingdom, man. I told him that. No, he no, told him that. So you're going, you're going, you're going to Norway. Basically, Sweden. just pick up the backpacking map for <laughs> Syrian migrants. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's gonna be it's gonna be Syrian migrants hitchhiking. There go the Hodge twins. Oh, I haven't seen you in a long time. Just kidding. <laughs> oh, black people. Oh, black people. We don't have many of them. We usually burn them. Um. So, wow. Norway, Sweden, Germany. You guys really do have a white fan base. You're going to a country with the population of Rhode Island and nary a colored amongst them. Yeah. Know, you yeah. know what's funny? All the black people who come on show they got white girlfriends. <laughs> Well, it's like, uh, don't they get a free drink or something on the two-drink minimum if they do that? I a lot of friends, man. <laughs> I don't think we need to beep that because you I said it. With <laughs> man, I guess. I don't know what it is, man. I've never had a lot of black friends, man. That used to hurt me. We had a couple. Yeah, I had a couple, man, but at, uh, within about four or five months, they tried to kill me. <laughs> um, I had this man was playing basketball man he pulled a damn big ass uh what, what the big ass blades called man uh which shank. no not a shank which blade 
Machete? No, that blade. It was a machete. <laughs> Wait, where was he carrying it? How long had you been playing basketball? Was this like in the third? I mean, when does this happen? It's about that big, man. He had me on the ground because I was frying him all day long. I was shooting threes all in space. I was talking trash. And he had he a machete. He, he, a... <laughs> he had a machete. You didn't notice he was walking around like he had a peg leg at no point. Did any suspicions arise? He had it. He used to show everybody, hey, man, look at my knife. I was like, wow, that's a nice knife, man. What you going to do with that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. That Ooh, you gonna like go real. hunting with that knife, man? You gonna go kill some deer with it or what? All right. Uh, on that note, listen, okay, I want people to go, uh, obviously, to go see you if you're there in Europe. I know we have a lot of European fans, particularly in the UK, where I cannot go. So you can go enjoy the Hodge Twins in our place, hodgetwinstour.com. You can follow them at Hodge Twins. And uh, I, obviously, they have a lot of merch. Maybe we need to, uh, maybe we need to co-create a Bitch Can't Breathe shirt and sell it in our store. <laughs> there you go. Hey, that's <laughs> Just you with a little Newsboys hat. Bitch can't breathe. <laughs> That'll be our, our top-selling shirt, I guarantee it. All right, Keith and Kevin, please stay strong. We appreciate your voice out there, and uh, don't get hurt when you go to Europe. Before I jumped, before I jumped into the pool, I had to put the sun, put the sunblock on my freckles, mm. and then you have to get you have to get out down under so oh. so you can look up. Ooh. Get busy, get busy swimming. Hold on, my breath is completely unnecessary. Oh, get busy perverting. Um, he's a rapist. That is the undertones. Allegedly. But, uh, That's the undertones. They're a little bit dark. Thank you to the Hodge Twins, Ralph Macchio, and uh, yeah. and uh, Kreesh. I just forgot. Martin, Martin Cove. I just forgot his, uh, his last name there. You okay? You look like yeah. you were suffocating for a bit. I was. And I, that, honestly, I don't know why I don't do better, more acting on that because it's... Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's hard on my body. Yeah. Mm. It's, it's, almost like, it's almost like you don't consider it your job. I know. But uh, looking forward... Uh, next week, by the way, no show Monday because it's uh, obviously... Because it's... Uh, Memorial Day. Where, where, where you remember... It's Memorial Day. And then I don't know if we have a show on Tuesday. I'm not entirely sure because we have some renovations going on in the studio like we talked about. We're build if you watch the behind the scenes, we're, we're building a whole new green screen uh, studio. So not entirely sure, but definitely not Monday. And uh, then we have a pretty big uh, week of shows Wednesday and Thursday. Thanks for Silence of the Mug Club. Everyone did some good work on that. And uh, thanks to the Hodge ones for coming in uh, here last minute. We, uh, like we said, we, we were booking Candace Owens today. And uh, uh, I think it was just a miscommunication where Something she had communicated with the booker. And then I, I don't know. I had it in my schedule. So sorry, Kate. We'd, we'd love to have her on. A lot of people had some questions for yeah. so hopefully we can have her on soon um you know w one thing i wanted to talk about here at the 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 end of this week and it's been a pretty pretty tiring week um let me just start with this you can't be anything you want to be you cannot you absolutely cannot be anything you put your mind to that's reality now let me let me clarify this because i've always been one especially uh, people say hold on isn't this usually where you encourage people you no listen i i can't stand dream I stealers Alaner. right i can't stand dream stealers at all there are people i i, I despise they're far i can't think of any people i despise more than dream dream killers okay i do think that people out there should dream i do think people should have ambitions and you can achieve unbelievable things certainly when most people say you can't usually they're wrong but you cannot be anything that you put your mind to now why do i say that? i say that because if you're going to start chasing some dreams and i get some emails again let me talk about a lot of college students a lot of people feel lost out there um and we have there's some modicum of success with this with this program we're incredibly grateful to everyone who's subscribed who's signed up for notifications who's bookmarked or joined mug club because youtube of course is trying to make it more and more difficult to reach you. Uh, so sometimes people say, well, listen, how, how, how do you make it happen? Uh, wh wh how, how do you determine success? How do you go after your dreams? Here's something. Uh, for example, I'm not, I'm not gonna be an NBA player. Neither is not gay, Jared. You're not gonna be. You're not gonna be a champion eater taking out Kobayashi anytime soon. No, I also can't drink milk. So. No, no, well, goat's milk. You said you might be, might be able try. to try goat's milk. When did that start? You weren't lactose I intolerant. I don't know. I'm just, just jumping on the gluten trend. 
Maybe. Could be a queer. <laughs> Uh, the, the point I'm trying to make here is, is we talk about truth a whole lot, and you do have to be truthful with yourself. And it doesn't help anybody just to blindly tell people, you can do anything you put your mind to. No, you can do most things you put your mind to, and most people don't fulfill their potential, and most people don't fulfill their potential not because they didn't put their mind to take a pick. They didn't fulfill their potential because they didn't, they, they didn't fulfill their purpose. You were designed, let's say you don't believe in God, okay, you exist for a purpose in the mere pragmatic sense that there is something you can probably do better than anyone else or as good as anyone else. And there are some things that you can't do very well. When I was in the eighth grade at one point, no, sorry, not the eighth grade, it was the fifth grade, uh, because I had watched Space Jam, I think, I, wa I wanted to play in the NBA for a bit. Then I realized it wasn't in the cards. <laughs> Now, that doesn't mean that you get, that doesn't mean you're giving up on a dream. You need to figure it out and experiment with things. Here's a, if you want to know how, how is it, how are you in your wheelhouse? How are you in your purpose? I think everyone has had this moment. This is one thing. I want you to take some time here. You don't have to do it right now during this segment, last segment of the week. Take some time, reflect on it, and think if this ever happened with you. Did you ever have a moment where you realized you weren't good at anything else, and all of a sudden it clicked that you were good at something? Let me tell you that for me, the reason that I'm doing this show, the reason this is, this is the only thing, that I could do is, I remember in high school, uh, not only did I have horrible handwriting, not only was I terrible at math, I mean, they thought they thought I was retarded for a while I, because of my handwriting and then also because of the fact that they thought I was retarded. And I was in French immersion. Turns out I just needed to go to English school. Um, and I was picked last for gym class, I think I told you this, after way long, the autistic Asian kid. Legitimate autistic, by the way, not like on the spectrum. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, like yeah. the kind of guy who would like piss his pants, forget who he was, and punch him in the balls, like that kind of guy. <laughs> way long. I remember I was picked at last after way long. Kid. And I remember, um, for some reason, I could make teachers laugh. For some reason, I could argue pretty well. For some reason, even though I was terrified of giving public speeches, uh, I was put to a provincial uh, competition in, in public speaking in high school. For some reason, bullies who would beat me would have to stop themselves from laughing while kicking my ass. <laughs> and I remember sitting in class when I didn't open my textbook at all. At all, at all, my senior year, my, my 10th and 11th grade years in high school, my math textbook. I missed her level as a teacher. God rest his soul. Nice guy, terrible math teacher. I didn't open it. And they said, what are you doing all day in class? And all I did was think. All I did was, you know, you call it daydreaming. And I know it sounds as a daydreaming. But all I would do is think about performing. At this point, I'd been writing stand-up. I remember when I got to college, I'd been performing stand-up. At that point, by my teens, I'd been doing acting since I was 12 years old. All I would do was think about going to Los Angeles to finish uh, what I was doing with acting or doing stand-up in front of big crowds or something like hosting a show. Podcasting hadn't been around yet. Immediately when MySpace came out and Dane Cook was a thing, MySpace comedy didn't exist, but through coding we uploaded these clips and I got into the Just for Laughs. But I remember sitting there and when they said, well, what, what, are, you, what are you doing? I just, I, I've never thought about anything else and I wasn't good at anything else. It's not like I woke up as a, t as a kid and all I ever wanted to be Oh, I knew right away I was going to be a podcast slash first ever online late night host who didn't endorse Hillary Clinton. I didn't know that. I wanted to be a firefighter at some point, and then I realized I wasn't very strong. And then I wanted to be, a, like I said, a basketball player. Couldn't run or jump. And so I had to be realistic with myself and say, oh, you know what? Here's one thing that you can do pretty well. You can do it pretty well. You've tried the other things. Here's one thing that you can do pretty well. See how far you can go with it. And what did that lead to? That led to striking out cold calling agents. That led to Tony Camacho, my first manager, sleeping on his daughter's couch in Jamaica Hills, Queens, when I was 18 years old doing two, three sets a night, every night in New York City, and I sucked a lot. That led to doing festivals and hosting shows with MTV that, that sucked and were terrible. And a lot of the time I thought that I wanted to quit because I can't believe that I'm hosting a game show on MTV for pennies on the dollar. And this is the only thing I was good at. Why couldn't I be good at building spacecraft? Why couldn't I be the best astronaut? I was really pissed about it. I, I was able to speak relatively well. That's what I was good at. I want you to think of that there's a moment for you in time. Almost everyone has a moment that you can think back to where you realize, okay, hold on a second. I think that I think this is something I can do. I think everyone has that moment and a lot of people just push it back because maybe it scares them because they want to think they can pick whatever they whatever their purpose is, but you can't. Did you, did you can you think back to a moment where you said, "Okay, this is something I can do. This is something I'm good yeah, at." Yeah, I think it came to me later in life because I was I was always inclined to technology and kind of uh, performance kind of stuff in, in high school, but it it didn't hit me very early on. It not as early as it hit you for sure. But once you once you did find that, once I found that, I'm like, oh, I, I enjoy this and I'm good at it, and I think I can make a dollar doing it. Yeah, support a family with it. So there was a moment that I clicked, and I was about 21, 22 years old. 
when it clicked for me. And by the way, that can the, the, this purpose can change. By the way, you can be career folk, and then you could your purpose could be to uh, to be a fantastic father or a fantastic husband, fantastic wife, fantastic mother. You could be a career woman before that. I want to make sure that people understand you're not fixed. You're not in one fixed track. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think one of the one of the things that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, learning which voice it, or, or learning which people in your life as you grow older, you have to yeah. figure out which ones do you owe and which ones you don't. It's also that there's a flip side of that: which voices matter and which ones don't. Because a lot of people will tell you, you know, the, the dream killers of life. That you could, can't do this, and then those people have inspired me to to do all those things. Yeah. And then there are people in your life who you need to realize, oh, my dad, or my mom, you know, they really love me, and look out for me, and they say I'm, you know, I am awful at drinking milk, and I have to take their word for it. <laughs> thank and God. Go with it. Thank God. Uh, thank God. My not my good. purpose is not professional milk tester. No. <laughs> if that's even a real thing. Um, okay. I'll and then I'll. That's a good point because you need to learn which voices to ignore in yourself. Yeah. Everyone is pulled apart by voices. Let me give you a couple examples, okay? We, I graduated young. I, usually I try not to get into names, but I'll tell you this. It was my ex-girlfriend's uncle. And I remember I've told this story. Maybe it was back when it was a three-hour show. I've told this story. I still think about it. Um, I was doing relatively well. You know, I did the voice on Arthur. And I was doing a lot of commercials, enough where I had saved up some money working in high school, missed a lot of days in school. Voice and, of Arthur, uh, they just give you a podcast after that, right? Yeah, they just give you a podcast after that, of course. That's how you leverage Sold it, that and the big Jew money. And everyone's <laughs> sitting there going, well, what are, what are you going to do, after, uh, what are you gonna do uh, after high school? And I said, you know what? I don't know. I think... Uh, I think I'd, I'd owe it to myself to try to go to Los Angeles and, and, and really see how far I can take this. And him, his wife, and his son started, hur, hur, and he had to laugh like this, hur, 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 hur. started laughing. Imagine the kind of person you have to be at a 16 year old, who, by the way, it's not like it's totally just, I'm gonna be an actor. It's like, at this point, I had already had my union card for six years. Yeah. You know, like I had done, I, 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 had, I had done some stuff and laughed and said, oh, maybe, maybe get your head out of the clouds and think about going into engineering, which was far less realistic. You don't want me building your planes at Pratt & Whitney. I don't want to fly in you with planes. And I remember I had a realization going, the fact that everyone thinks this is laughable and I don't, okay, may, maybe this is something I can do. One more story, it was in college, Spanish teacher, couldn't stand her, I can't even remember her name. I knew I was doomed to fail. I knew I was doomed to fail Spanish. She immediately removed 30% from my grade at the beginning of the semester. The reason for that was, this was in Canada. And the reason, yeah, I was learning, I thought, ah, I don't know, I can learn three languages. Weird. Turns out now I know more, more Brazilian style Portuguese than Spanish. That's how effective it is. At, that's how effective learning a language in school is. And not at all. So uh, she took 30% off my grade. And the reason was I had missed three classes. Now we were visiting my family in Texas at the time and Hurricane Katrina happened. Mm -hmm. And so actually, we ended up staying a little bit longer. I remember calling my teachers saying, hey, listen, I'm not going to be in, in school for the first couple of weeks. Can you send me the homework? All the other teachers sent me my homework. She didn't. She said, you, you lose 10% for each class you miss in my class. I mean, talk about a horrible human being, right? So I go and I'm like, well, listen, I really want to pass this class. I'm really not doing very well. And uh, I'd like to be tutored. She said, you don't need to be tutored. What you need to do is come into my office twice a week, and I'll help you, and you'll be fine. Well, we get about two-thirds through the semester, and she tells me you're failing. I'm like, I know, right? She says, I think, you need a, I think you need a counselor at the, uh, the library. I said, but I, but, uh, uh, but I said I needed it. That's what I said. And you said, don't do it. She said, no, no, you use the word tutor, not counselor. And I was sitting there going, okay, I see where this is going. And she said at that time, she said, well, I don't know why you screw around so much in my class. I don't know what you're thinking about in class. What do you think? You're going to do the Just for Laughs or something? And the day before I had just, and not a big deal, but it's a pretty big comedy festival for young aspiring comedians. The day before I had just found out that I was the youngest comedian ever to do the Just for Laughs. And so that was a defining moment for me, where I said, okay, the fact that she thinks it's so absurd, and I don't know what I can accomplish, but I do know there's some confirmation that I'm certainly better at this than Spanish, that I'm certainly better at this than math, that I'm certainly better at this than basketball. So when people go out there and say, you know, I, I want to be successful, but you know, I'm, I'm down, how, how do I, how do I you know, it seems like you have it figured, I don't have it figured out. This is honestly pretty, since I've known Not Gay Jared, mm -hmm. we were doing an AM radio show, and I said, as long as I own the rights, we'll syndicate this out nationally. And then we started podcasting it. And remember, we said, I don't think this can work on radio. I think no. this is going to, I don't think radio is going to live for a much longer time. Yeah. Then we started doing this with, I don't know if conservatives are going to want to watch a late night show. They're so used to listening to AM radio where all people do is bitch about Obama. We didn't know that it was going to work, but it hit a certain point when we had the Nick DiPaolo's and the Jim Norton's and the Owen Benjamins of the world banging on the door saying, hey, I really like what you're doing. I really appreciate what you're doing. We said, we can do this. Yeah. Not a year before, not even a year before I met you, I had a friend, a close friend tell me, I, when I told him, you know, I really want to, you know, make a go of like producing and things, he said, "You need to get your head out of the clouds, Jared." Right. He told me that. It it has driven me mad ever since, and it's kind of, you know, I don't want to say, re, re, you know, re, revenge is the best form of success. Sorry, success, success is, is the best, best form of revenge. Revenge is the best form of success. That's, pow, 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 pow. <laughs> That's successful. <laughs> No, you're just a serial that, that, killer. That, that, that. Ooh, tomato, I say broken spleen. We'll fix that in post. But yeah, yeah you know what I mean. 
Yeah. So, I mean, it, it really has driven me. Some of those it absolutely words. Does. Yeah. And uh, it absolutely does drive it. Now, look, look at what you're doing now. Here, here's the thing. If you were going to talk about fulfilling a purpose and, and living a life where you feel fulfilled, people who say you can do anything you put your mind to, they're about as stupid as the people who say men can do anything women can do, women can do anything men can do. Those people are just about as stupid as people who tell you just play it safe. Just do, don't leave the state, stay close to mom. Don't try something that most people don't do. What you need to do, like you said, is you talked about eliminating voices from your life, other people. Figure out the ones that matter, figure out the ones that don't. You are doing yourself a great disservice if you aren't being truthful with yourself in your alone time. And I have found in my life that when I sit and I speak with people, when I speak with fans, particularly young fans who are trying to find direction in life, particularly people who we've even hired here who were younger, I talk with them and I say, when did you realize this is what you wanted to do? Or when did you realize what you want to do and what is it? Almost everyone can pin that moment. Just like the flash of genius in invention with a product or some kind of a new service, that's a film, it's actually a legal term, flash of genius, it can be traced. Almost everybody can trace back to a moment where they realized you didn't know you were gonna be the best. I don't think Michael Jordan knew he was gonna be the best. I don't think Wayne Gretzky knew he was gonna be the best. I think at some point they said, I can do this and owed it to themselves to do it to the best of their ability, to chase that trail down with everything they had. And sometimes it pans out, sometimes it doesn't, but you'll be happier if you try it. The key is that starting off point, like everything else we talk about, it's gotta be truth. Find that moment. There's something you can do that someone else can't do. Either you can do it to the best of your ability, you could be the best in the world at it, or at least as good as the elite of the elite of the elite, and people around you can't do it. Everyone has that. And by the way, people are saying, well, yeah, that's a nice thing to say, but what about uh, what about people who, uh, who are retarded, for example? I can tell you there are people at Friendship Club right now where we used to work with special needs people. They could give you a multiplication table like that, any number you pick. I can show you people there with a capacity for love that I've never seen with anyone else. People who have the ability to pick up on emotions from other people that I've never seen anyone else. So, so sometimes people will surprise you with what they're capable of doing, and sometimes you'll surprise yourself, but it's gotta start from a point of truth. Trace that moment, figure it out. What do you think you can do pretty well? What do you think you can do better than the next guy and do it to the best of your ability. Do it with everything you have. See what happens. And if you fail, well, at least you had a life of purpose. Get mad, you sons of a